Hello, thank you for tuning in to the Outstanding Ohioan Show. Today, this is episode 87, and I have the privilege of talking with Ken Krasolovic, who is the co-author of League Park, the historic home of Cleveland baseball, 1891 to 1946, and a longtime athlete, coach, and administrator in baseball and other collegiate sports. Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for asking me. It was a great surprise and uh, happy to be here. Uh, well, I, as I told you when we spoke on the phone the other night, when, when we connected, I, I read the book a couple of years ago and I loved it. Uh, I, I first heard about League Park. My grandmother grew up in Cleveland and she, we were talking baseball and when you're a little kid and you're getting involved in things, uh, it, it's so neat if you have the opportunity to talk to your grandparents. And when she told me she was a baseball fan, that, that kind of surprised me, but it was great. And she would, she talked about league park and going there to see ba She saw Babe Ruth play there. And obviously even in the movie Sandlot, every kid knows Babe Ruth, right? <laughs> so, so that, that really, <laughs> that really sparked my interest. And, and I, I remember even asking her, well, well let's go visit it. And it, it, she said, well, it's not in a very good neighborhood now and those kind of things. So I've, I've never been there. I, I do want to take my boys there sometime to see it uh, when we're up there. But I, I have a feeling that's a similar experience for a lot of people my age and your age is we had grandparents and older relatives and friends that – first told us about it. And I know you've got a neat story when you first heard about it. Could you share that with the audience? Well, yeah, my, the first I heard of it was um, the first major league game I went to was uh, at Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, even though I grew up in Cleveland. I was seven and uh, we went, uh, we went to, to Pittsburgh um, and um, it was like a group travel thing or whatever. And so there were a couple dads that were going to the, the Pirates game. And uh, my dad said, come on, let's go. I was, oh my God, I was so happy. And we took a cab over from some downtown hotel. The first we got out of the, we got out of the cab. And uh, my father looked up and he said, oh my gosh, this is just like Lee Park was. You know, the street, the sidewalk, and then this wall, here it is. There's the outside of the, the stadium. And, and that was the first I had heard of it. And, uh, you know, obviously got more and more involved with baseball as, as I grew up and going to games and whatnot. And, you know, it's funny, you know, I'm old enough and my father was old enough that he told me his Babe Ruth story at League Park. Um, so I have a similar one, you know, uh, my dad telling me that, you know, when he was a kid, you know, they, they, they gave uh, tickets for weekday games to Cleveland City School kids, you know, um, you know, up in the upper deck and whatnot, trying to build fans for the future. And uh, he said they would, you know, everybody wanted to get Yankees tickets. So you usually got two, two tickets or whatever. And, you know, so you'd have to trade your two to get one to get the Yankees. Somehow you got a Yankees ticket, whatever, the one time. And I guess it was probably early 30s, you know, 31, 32, something like that. And the story he told me was he was in the upper deck um, above the third base dugout, somewhere near the third base dugout, looking down and, you know, an inning ends, it's middle of the game, and here comes Ruth, you know, trotting in from right field, across the infield, and he doesn't go to the, the dugout. He says, my father told me the story. He goes, he goes, like, to the aisle where, the you know, the, the steps come down, one of the aisles, a, a section or two past the dugout, and he calls down the, the, the kid vending hot dog, pulls money out of his back pocket, buys, like, four, you know, a handful of hot dogs, four or five hot dogs, right there in the middle of the game, and takes him and goes in the dugout. So my, that was my dad's, uh, you know, Babe Ruth at Lee Park story. Um, so, you know, it, it, sure, and it's so ironic because it, it lends credence to that, you know, not only to the Ruth, uh, you know, uh, that that's what you hear about him, that he was, he would do crazy stuff like that. And, uh, you know, but also that Lee, Lee Park and that, that view from up above and the, the, the tight seating and the, the, the compact upper deck and, things you don't see anymore in stadiums so pretty cool it's neat that you tell the story about Forbes Field because 
Well, my grandmother, who I just mentioned, grew up in Cleveland. My her husband, my grandfather, he grew up in near Pittsburgh, and Forbes Field was the first field he went to. Okay. He remembered seeing Hank Greenberg and Ralph Kiner and in those folks when he was growing up. Right. Yeah, I was lucky to have seen it in the '60s. You know, before they made the move, and I, you know, it's so weird to think. And I've seen games in three different stadiums in Pittsburgh. You know, like, wow, that makes you feel old. <laughs> And I know we'll, um, I guess we could talk about it now, uh, that it, it's interesting how trends have gone, um, because I, living in the Cincinnati area now, I, I know a lot of old timers that uh, went to Crosley Field, and talk a little bit about why League Park was in the middle of a neighborhood, uh, because that's, that seemed to be the trend around that time, and we, we've gone away from that mostly. Um, could, could you speak to yeah, that? Uh, the, sure. And the, the reason we've gotten away from it is because, you know, ballparks are now are now municipally state funded. They're federally funded, whatever it is, for each particular park. And in those days, they were a private entity. So, so where are you going to go? You're going to go where you can get some land and, and get it, you know, relatively cheap. You need a full block which, you know, determined the, the parameters of the ballpark, the dimensions and whatnot. And that's what happened in most of these cities. So, you know, Cleveland during the 1800s, it had several places and they kind of kept, every time there was a new place, it kind of went a little further east from downtown. Because again, you're looking for an open chunk of land. Well, um, Mr. Robeson, who owned the, uh, the Spiders of the National League, um, in the, in the late 1880s and, and then uh, looked to get a new ballpark. Um, you know, he spied a, a plot of land at, at uh, 66 in Lexington and, um, you know, not too far from downtown, but again, a little further out than the previous ballpark. And uh, the irony for him was, or not irony, the plan for him was that his other business was that he was, he operated streetcar lines, you know, buses and you know transit today and that's public transportation um it's it's run by a public entity but in those days it was a private entity the streetcar lines were, were privately operated they uh, had like you know deals with the city because they had to have tracks on the streets and whatnot but but uh you know the the business was a private business and he happened to own the uh the lines that went by that that plot of land so you know, you hear the term, uh, they get you coming and going. He did. <laughs> he got your nickel for riding the, the trolley line to get there and got, got their nickel for when they left and, you know, collected the money at the ticket windows and then whatever they bought inside the ballpark. And, you know, and ballpark was originally opened in 1891 as a wooden uh, structure. And, you know, there were no automobiles yet. You got there, you know, you, you took the streetcar. Um, maybe you walked if you were close enough. Uh, I guess maybe some folks had still, you know, had hair, horse, you know, uh, vehicles, horse-drawn vehicles or whatever, but uh, the bulk of the people took the streetcar lines. So Robeson, uh, you know, that's why he picked that, that block of land. There was one corner of it that was not, and that's kind of an interesting story too, because uh, the corner um, at 66th and Lexington, which actually became the, the main entrance of the ballpark, in its second configuration, 1910, when it became a concrete and steel ballpark, well, that corner was a, a, a saloon. A guy named Mr. Kalaki owned a saloon there, and he also had a couple of plots of ground next to it um, where he had his house and his sister owned a house. So um, they had to kind of build a short porch to right field because Mr. Kalaki was there. He didn't want to sell his property, especially knowing there were going to be people buying tickets and going to games and whatnot. That's pretty good for his saloon business. <laughs> Eventually, he gave in and sold the property uh, about 15 years later uh, in the first uh, decade of the 1900s. And uh, that, you know, impacted the configuration and all. And then, you know, the whole story with League Park, which is detailed, as you say, in, in the book, all that is outlined. Right. Uh, if you could, Ken, for our audience, talk about where you grew up and you really, it's been a lifelong involvement with baseball and athletics. Can you 
take us through that journey? Yeah, I'm very fortunate to have been able to do what I wanted to do for for my my whole life. Um, sometimes I had to have another, you know, main job or whatever, or, you know, and through, through some of the places I've been to, to be able to get to do what I wanted to do. But uh, yeah, I, I was fortunate enough to be able to kind of manipulate my positions and what I was doing. I grew up in, in the sur suburban Cleveland uh, in Euclid and, um, you know, it was a great baseball town um, as well. You know, suburban uh, Cleveland has some of them were real hotbeds. Euclid was certainly one of them. Every kid just about played baseball. The, the, the youth leagues and stuff were incredible. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I got, I wound up getting a journalism degree because I, you know, I, I figured, well, I want to do something in sports and writing came fairly, you know, naturally to me. And I thought, well, if I, if I, I can be a sports reporter or whatever, that would be pretty cool. Well, um, while I was in college, got kind of an internship, got involved with um, working in the sports information offices. I got an internship actually in the summertime um, doing some sports public relations work. And, you know, I kind of started to realize that I, as much as I enjoyed journalism, I really liked being on the inside on the team side and knowing what was happening as opposed to being a reporter and trying to find out the story. Um, so that's, that's how I got in. I started out in sports information. Um, my first year out of school, out of college, I was uh, actually the assistant SID at Cleveland state. And then I got the uh, head SID job at John Carroll university um, in uh, university Heights outside of Cleveland. Um, and, you know, again, so I fell into it, you know, I'd been coaching summer ball, playing still summers and whatnot. And, um, the athletic director there was the former football coach. He was the AD at the time, but he stayed in coaching by coaching baseball. And I got hired as the SID and, you know, I said, gee, I've been coaching, you know, um, I was coaching like, uh, what they called class B up here, which was adults, you know, 18 to 21 year olds. I was like a player coach for a while and I kind of kept coaching it. And uh, I said, gee, I'd love to be involved. He said, man, I, I can use somebody. And he, all he had was a, a pitching coach who was, uh, happened to be a fellow named Doc Yakshaw, who was a, a world renowned uh, expert in, uh, in Dickens and in, uh, and in Shakespeare, <laughs> the uh, English prophet for John Carroll. He was our pitching coach. What a character. Well, Jerry Schweiger was the AD. He brought me on as an assistant coach. Um, you know, I got there at the right time. We, we got good when I got there. The first year we were still under 500, but we were overall, but we won the conference. First time they ever won the conference. I was there five years. We won the, the pennant in the, the conference for, for the five years that I was there. So I felt like I had a good input on, 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 on a successful program and um, it was a good start. I, I left there. I got an opportunity to go to Division One. I. I went to St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. I got hired as the sports information director there. The job evolved over the years, but I, again, I lucked out. I got there. They had just hired a head baseball coach. He was 24 years old. I was 28, I guess. He was the youngest head coach in the country. We, we met, you know, and we hit it off. He, I said, I told him, I said, gee, I was coaching at John Carroll. He goes, I could really use a some help. So um, he brought me on the staff and uh, I was there for all 17 years. I worked there. My main job evolved. I, I was the, I, I actually was, uh, became the play-by-play -play voice of the basketball program there, which was a phenomenal experience in itself. Um, my main job, you know, got out of sports information, got involved with uh, um, athletic marketing and, and um, some other, you know, things along those lines got involved in some of the development efforts, fundraising and whatnot. Um, but primarily the broadcasting thing and, and licensed products as well. I was, I oversaw that. So I had my hands in all this different stuff, but I still was able to coach baseball in the spring. And, um, when I left there and again, it was a great run, um, you know, got to be involved with, you know, at, at the highest level of, of NCAA athletics and, but I got an opportunity to be an athletic director um, and the head baseball coach back here, you know, close to my home at Lake Erie College. Um, so I came back. I took that job. Um, there was a bunch of uh, administrative turnover after I had been there for about four years. 
and uh, I, 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 I was able to, to get out and get a, another position. I wound up at a JUCO um, back on the East Coast. I was in Maryland at, uh, and uh, we, we took a program there that had, had you know, a little bit of limited success, success in a couple sports, but never really did it. We, we wound up deciding to go um, Division One at the JUCO level. And um, I, I lucked into having a, I was wound up being the assistant coach. Uh, I had a young guy that was the head coach that had just started and he's now in the Orioles organization. He's a tremendous coach, but I was there for over a decade with him. And, um, you know, he, and he gets the credit. I mean, he's, like I said, he's an amazing coach, but he got the program really running. And and I I was kind of, I was, you know, at first I had a lot of input in certain things, but as he got more and more experienced, you know, my role became, you know, I was, I was Zimmer. I was the old guy, you know, <laughs> older guy in the dugout that tried to, you know, that, that helped uh, bring some perspective at times and whatnot. And I think I helped in that way, but uh, yeah, so we wound up going to the Juco uh, division one world series, phenomenal experience. We were really good placing a lot of guys in the pros and whatnot. And, and he wound up um, uh, as well. Um, you know, moving on from there just uh, shortly after I left. And when I left, I was I had actually been commuting to Maryland from here, from Ohio for over 10 years. And uh, finally, uh, you know, figured out a way to get back here and kind of get involved in some other things, which is what I do now. I got my hands in some other things. I, I guess you'd call me a consultant or a contractor because I do a lot of different things. And so it's, it's fun. I get, again, I'm still getting to do what I like to do and want to do. Um, and, and doors have continued to open. I just got uh, invited to go back to Croatia. I was lucky I, along the way when I was in, uh, when I was in Philadelphia, I got, uh, I wound up going to Croatia. I was the head coach of the Croatian uh, national Olympic team for, uh, for baseball for uh, three, three years. Um, you know, went over in the summers and now I'm going back now. And my son here, uh, who was a Division One baseball player? Um, he wound up getting a Croatian um, a citizenship. He's a dual citizen now, so he's playing on the. He can play for the Croatian national team, and I'm back as an assistant coach. So it's it's amazing how all these things have happened, and I've been lucky to be involved in, in so much, so much, and so much I've seen and places I've been, and I owe it all to you know baseball and the broadcasting, the basketball broadcasting has really done a lot too. In your coaching career, from thinking back from the time you started to when you, when you wrapped up, what, what do you think was the biggest change with you personally in how you coached? Well, you definitely mature. And I, and I probably anyone in any field, um, if you ask them, you know, what was the difference as you, you know, you got 30 years in or whatever, and you think back, you know, how, I mean, you're, you're immature. You know, I was 20, I was, again, I was lucky. I was 23 years old. I was college coach, um, college athletic administrator. And, um, you know, and I, I see it today, you know, and I, I, I hope I wasn't, um, I hope I didn't make as many mistakes as I see sometimes made by younger folks today, but I'm sure I did make some that I can't even remember. But, you know, again, you just get more mature. And as a coach, I, I clearly learned patience, um, you know, and of course the rules were, were different back then. You know, you could get thrown out of a game and it didn't matter. You were always back for the next game. Now there's these built in all these, you know, different rules. So it, it's changed. And I became, again, you know, my later years, I became, the guy, you know, when I first got to Maryland, that guy that's with the Orioles now, Tom Eller, he's a phenomenal coach. But I mean, I saw me and him at that time, you know, he would, you know, his frustration with umpires or a situation or whatever, and um, how he handled it. And I was kind of, I was able to think back and, and to, you know, kind of maybe give him some perspective at times and help him mature, maybe hopefully more quickly than I did. And, and I think I did. And and again, he, as a baseball guy, knowledge-wise of the game, he was incredible. I mean, he just, he, you know, where he is now, he's still got a ways to go. He, he can, he, his ceiling is 
is really high. But now here he is. I guess he's probably what, getting close to 40, I guess, late 30s, whatever. And, and, and uh, you know, he's in pro ball and, and, you know, he has a chance to really make it. And I'm proud of him. And, you know, and I, that's one of the rewarding things about being in athletics and being an AD and being involved in all the things I did is to see people that I maybe identified early or helped early on and see them succeed. That's, it's really cool. <laughs> I was lucky also at Hartford that we left some things behind. We built, we built some facilities, got some things accomplished there that are amazing. So they're very rewarding. In your opinion, what constitutes a well-run practice and how did you develop that? Well, I think in baseball, I think generally the biggest problem in practice is um, waste of time. I think practices are way too long, generally. Uh, most coaches run practices that are way too long, that um, are boring. Um, I like practices that are, you know, set. You have an idea what you're going to get done. And it, it's, it, you know, the NCAA had to, um, had to insert rules. This goes back now. Jeez, it's been 30 years when, when they put in all, you know, limits, hour limits, day, week, you know, with definitions of what practices are, pr practice times. And, and I see coaches today that think that means that's how much you're supposed to practice. You need to fulfill that NCAA maximum. And um, whatever they allow, we, we better do it to that, to that level. And I don't, I don't buy in. I don't buy in. I, I, think, it's, I think it's too much. I think the whole, the whole routine of baseball pregame drives me crazy. Basketball players get to a, the basketball arena an hour before a game. I traveled with you know, big-time basketball for – 15 17 years it, it had to broadcast for 17 and you know you get there they suit up they go out they shoot around they go back in the locker room they come out they shoot around again for a couple of minutes and they play you know baseball has this whole routine we have to go through all this stuff and you know the routine of the, the batting you know, the bp and the the io and all you know all the stuff we do it's it's so long we we turn a three-hour game into a into a six hour marathon. We turn a, a, a five hour double header into a, you know, nine hours at the ballpark. It's, it's, it's crazy. And I think that I, 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 I always try to find ways to, to shorten that stuff. I liked to, I, I didn't want to get to the ballpark too early. And uh, that was one thing that Tom <laughs> Eller, who I've spoke so highly of, um, you know, he and I did kind of clash on that. You know, he, I, I used to say, hurry up and wait, you know, like we, we'd hurry up to get there and then, okay, now we got to wait around for, you know, 50 minutes until it's our block to hit, you know, and I, I, I would rather risk that we, you know, maybe we get a traffic jam or whatever, something happens and we're, we're, we're tight rather than that we're there waiting for all this time. I just, I, I don't like that part about baseball. That's the only thing I don't, I love the game. But I do think that some of the tradition of those things is, is overblown, I think. And to tie it back to your question, I think practices um, can be way too long and boring. I think it's, it's skills. You know, I even, I, you know, you mentioned you have kids that are in that age of, you know, they're doing, you know, youth ball, travel ball, whatever it is, 10, 11 years old. And I remember when I got involved with helping my kids' teams and, you know, it's, you know you're in January or February or whatever and they're, they're saying, all right, we're going to have a practice. We're going to be indoors. And it's like, we're going to be there for two. You know, I got, I got the gym, this gym from f five to seven or whatever. Okay. And say so like, we got 13 guys, five, two hours with thir how many throws can they make? You know, like it's too much. You know, I'd rather have a good hour and get them through in an hour or an hour and 15 and make it concentrated and, you know, do tight, tightly 
um, scheduled drills and BP that, that's moving and get, okay, and you have you have pitchers that have to throw or whatever. Yeah, they're 11 years old and you want them to throw. Okay, what do they need to throw in February? You know, 15 pitches, 20 pitches. You know that you just you just want to get them going. I, I, I again, I my opinion is is that we 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 stretch too much of this stuff out. You know, um, Phil Martelli, who was the coach of basketball at St. Joe's for so many years and a uh, pretty famous guy, you know, and I broadcast their games and all that time. And he used to say he hated that people would say like, hey, coach, hey, coach. He's like, I'm not a doctor. Don't call me coach. I don't need that. Like, call me Phil, he used to say. And, and I think that's true. I think people take this, take coaching that it's that, you know, that, that they're a doctor or whatever it is. I, I don't. I don't, I, I totally agreed with him on that, that you don't need that. You don't, it, it's the call me Phil thing meant so much about his personality and um, how he ran things. And, um, you know, I think that was a big part of his success. So um, again, I, I, I just, I, I don't like the egos that are in coaching. I think that what I've seen is, is a development of, of coaches at the college level, like when I first recruited, I, I, I was trying to get guys to come. And now it's like coaches act like they're holding this magic ticket and th their job is to get the guys that they don't want to come not to come, <laughs> you know? And it just, I, I, it just, it leaves a, I'm not comfortable with it a lot of times. And, and there's kind of an arrogance among some coaches um, about what they do. And, and that, again, I, I would, I like guys that work hard and you can recognize it. I don't want to be, I don't need to be told how good your program is or whatever. I can make that assessment by watching. And, and so um, that's, that's something that's changed. Um, certainly over the years uh, is, is not only the players, I mean, people have changed, but the, the coaches have changed. Uh, there's, there's a different approach. I, I you know, I, I, we were, our success in Maryland was largely, you know, especially the later years was largely on, you know, this, the launch angle stuff. Tom was one of the premier guys, one of the early guys. That's how he wound up with the Orioles now. He's learned that he's, he's an expert. But I like, I mean, I still like the bunt. And I, you know, I still do. I like the, the theory of it and whatever. Not that I really coach it, use it the same way now as we did way back. But there's a difference about teaching it where, you know, pe people, how many times have you heard people say, kids don't know how to bunt? You know, nobody, nobody knows how to, well, that's the coach's fault. If they don't know how to bunt, that means the coaches aren't teaching it. The coaches aren't, instru you know, in instructing how to bunt. And and so when they, you know, when you hear the the concept, oh, big leaders and they don't know how to bunt. Well, I'm guessing even at that level, they're not spending very much time. So you can blame the players or target the players or whatever, but it's it's that's a result of coaching too. And 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 the approach is definitely changed now, but players have to you have to explain now what when you do stuff <laughs> players need to understand you know when i was a kid coach said you know run here do the you did it now you okay fellas we're going to do this because this is <laughs> here's why we do this here's why we're doing this you kind of almost have to do that nowadays so that's clearly a change from the player side that was a really i've had some really long answers <laughs> for oh, you <laughs> It means I ask good questions. That's what okay. I always say. <laughs> well, well, or it means I just yacked way too long. So, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I take almost a perverse delight in trying to create the best practice plans to maximize learning. It, it's, it, it I, I get such a charge out of it, and probably the paradigm I learned within the past year that one of the things that's really helped the most is the the concept of block versus random practice. I, I never had really heard that term, but you know, just 
the, the block theory where you're just doing the same thing over and over and over again, you think the player's learning, but they really need that random, the random situations where they're not doing it rep after rep after rep, but they're, they're, they're doing something else and they're taking breaks in between. Um, and I think it was that the Daniel Coyle book, the little book of talent where I first read that concept and just working with my, my son on, on that with baseball and basketball and, and teams I've coached, it's, it's been a very powerful tool. I'm, I'm buying I, I, what you're saying. I'm, I'm on board. And then the, the, the other one that it, it's, it's really got me thinking about how to simulate, because we're, we're always trying to simulate competitive game situations and you're always trying to, bring out competitive spirit and, and work on fundamentals. Uh, but it, it's really the concept of trying to introduce stimulus that involves decision-making. And again, not just doing a drill, we're going to field a grounder and we're going to throw it to, we're going to throw it, but we, we've got to creating situations, whether you're making a situation up or you're having a base runner, um, one of the things I, I recently wrote down because I'm, I'm, I'm new to coaching baseball. I've, I've coached basketball for a long time. And one of the things I wrote down is we do the T work and we do the batting practice work in, in the cages and such, but I want to get that on the field more with fielders so the fielders can get reps off the bat and, and then potentially rotate base runners and do those kind of things because what we saw with our kids is they don't play in the backyard. They're not playing at the park pickup and whether that's basketball or baseball or anything. So you've, I think coaches really have to introduce those game like situations, the random practice. You can have the block practice to, to teach skills and, 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 and fine tune them, but you ultimately need to put them in the test environment. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I, I agree. I think, you know, I, I think batting practice is a great example. I think, you know, if you stand in that cage and you're taking 10 cuts in a row, that's, all you, when do you get 10 cuts in a row, and, you know, at bat in a game? Right. It might happen to you once in your career that you get 10 foul balls or something, you're up there that long. It doesn't happen. And, and, you know, when you're there that long, when you're standing in the cage that long, <clears throat> taking that many swings in a row, you're probably creating more bad habits than good ones. Um, so I, I think it's best, I mean, to try, even if you're just one guy, to take a few cuts, you know, step back, breathe, relax, come in again. All right, throw me five more balls, you know. Um, I, I think that's, that, that ties into what you're saying. Like you can, you can overdo things and if they, they get out of the realm of what happens in a game, that's not, I don't know if that's really helping me, you know? Um, I guess there are some repetitive things. I, you say you coach basketball, I guess shooting a hundred free throws makes you better at shooting free throws, even though you never shoot a hundred in a row in a game. I, I guess that does. I guess, you know, I, I guess you know, you're fielding ground balls. You, there's nothing wrong with fielding 15 or 20 ground balls in a row. And, you know, I think that's, the, that's okay. But there are certain things that are, again, like I say, hitting. That, you know, because there's so much involved in that, I think that's where you can have a flaw. If you're, you don't want to take 100 swings in a row or 50 or whatever it is, to try and get it to a smaller group, I think is, is bet. I think that, so yeah. my answer to you is yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's, I think there's balance in that too. Because uh, one, one of the things I, I would do with, I started doing with my son when we would go to the ballpark on our own is we would simulate an inning. So I would pitch to him. However, he hit the ball, we would say whether it's a hit or an out and we would, we would play it his half inning at the plate. And then when that was done, he'd go, he'd go to the outfield as soon as he caught three fly balls. Then, okay. he'd, come, then he'd come back again. That's interesting. And, yeah. 
after he batted, he'd go to the pitcher's mound and he'd pitch an inning. And then we do that again, and then we do infield. And we're just trying right. to just trying to break it up and keep it fresh. Now I will say, in the old days, you know, and even when I started coach when I first coached I coached our pitchers through batting practice on off days. And no one does that anymore. Why is that? I don't know, but Bob Feller's spinning in his grave, man, because right. you know he <laughs> did and he felt, you know, like and again, is that repetition of no, he I mean his theory was that's how you built stamina. That's how you, you know, you strengthened your arm was by using it. And and that clearly that, you know, that thinking is gone. And I think there's there's so much fear of and this ties to what how society is today, you know, like who's whose fault is it? You know, a kid hurts his arm. Oh, it's the coach coach threw him too much. Got, you know, anything that happens, it's somebody's fault. It's not that it just happened. It's somebody's fault. Who's who is liable for this? And so, and again, then the higher level you go, the, the more the stakes are. You get to college, you get to pro ball, you know, a guy signing contracts that are ten million dollars a year for a premium pitcher. Well, you, Jesus, you you know, you better protect that investment, baby. Because if that guy gets hurt, that's not the result of just a bad luck. It's whose fault? Well, the man, the, the pitching coach and the manager misused him. They overused him. They, you know, the theory has changed. And was Bob Feller as valuable then as Kershaw is today? Of course. Of course. But it was, you know, there, it was not, it was a different attitude a different approach it wasn't the blame game it wasn't the liability you know i umpired a game a week ago and and late in the game i had a team that said this was like pony like 13 14 year olds and i had a coach come out and say that the bat that was used was illegal. And it was too late because the next batter had come up to the plate. Had already pitched thrown him. And then they came out and said, that bat, we're looking at that bat. What are you going to do about it? I said, there's nothing I can do. It's over. Like, you had to, if you had to come out when he, after he got the base hit, then I, it was, and it's an illegal bat. Yeah, I, I, I'll call him out. I'm ringing him up. Okay, it's an illegal bat. We'll enforce the, the rule, or, you know, remove the. He's like, he's like, but we're telling you now that's an illegal bat. You need to go over there and remove. I said, I don't, first of all, I don't know for sure what bat he used. I wasn't paying any attention. You can pick out a bat over there and tell me that's the one he used when he was just batting. I don't know that. I don't. So this fella came up to me after and he said, he said, if that bat comes back in the game and that kid hits a hits a line drive and knocks out my shortstop with a line drive, he says to me, "You're liable." Here we, you know, this is two thousands. <laughs> Somebody's wait a minute. The rules of baseball are if he if you want to identify that bat when he walks up with it and say it's illegal, yes, I then the rules allow me to remove you know remove the game. If I spotted it myself, I could. But his, he, he was furious because I, I wouldn't go to the dugout to look for this bat and remove it. And I said, you know, at the beginning of the game, I asked both coaches, are your two players legally equipped? I said, I said to him, I said, you know, pretty sure I'm handling this right. I've only been umpiring a little bit <laughs> shortly now. But, you know, again, it came back. His first thing was, you're liable. You know, you're, you're, you're liable for this. Wow, you know, like it's that that's the world we live in. That 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 thought, that thing is out there. It hovers over everything. 
you know, we they used to play exhibition games and, you know, everybody's, you know, oh my God, a guy played in the World Baseball Classic, it screwed up his career and nobody can do anything anymore. Everybody's so afraid something happens. Well, okay, anything that happens subsequently, there's your reason. Oh, he pitched in the World Baseball Classic in March. That's why he's not having as good a season this year. I mean, you know, the and the analysis, the approach is so different. You know, guys that, you know, Feller's season would end and he'd go on tour, you know, and pitch all around the country until it was too cold not to pitch anywhere. You know, I, I, it's it, it's sad in a way because we lose out on all of those other cool things that used to happen. None of it can happen anymore. None of it. And, oh. and, you know, guys are pulled out of games. You know, they're throwing a no-hitter, but, geez, he's at 110. I can't, you know, we don't, you know, because if the next game is a bad game, they're going to say it's because I let him go 120 trying to get the no-hitter. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm not in that, I'm not, I'm not managing guys that are making millions of dollars. So, I, I guess – I guess I'd probably have to fall in line if I was doing it, but it, it, it is frustrating. You know, it, it's frustrating to see that some of those changes. Yeah. It's uh, working at the Miami rec center. One of the, within the last couple of years, kind of to your point, we have a lot of swim meets in our facility and we had a volunteer that slipped on the pool deck, hurt themselves and we we treated them for first aid and everything. Well, he ended up having a torn, some torn cartilage or a ligament, and he sued the university for damages. Of course, because he said because he said we didn't have a sign up that said the pool deck was wet. <laughs> yeah. Well, I my my famous one on this the first year I told you I coached in Croatia, so I was a head coach, Croatian national team. So the first year, first time I went over there, in ninety ninety six. Um, we went on an off day to a place called Pl Plitvis Lakes. If you ever have a chance to go to Croatia and see Plitvis Lakes, it is the most beautiful national park I've ever seen in my life. Phenomenal. So, okay, so we're there and we're walking around and there's, you know, paths and crystal clear water, waterfalls. It was an amazing place. And, you know, so there's these uh, like little bridges that you could cross. I mean, it's like, you know, logs tied together no handrail, no nothing. And, you know, so as we're crossing one of these, I said to the guy I was coaching with, Croatian guy, I said, I said, man, this is a lawsuit waiting to happen. Somebody falls off this thing into that drink. And he's like, yeah, you Americans, you're nuts. He goes, if you fall off that thing here, that's your problem. You took the risk to walk over that bridge. If you fall off it, that's your fault. That's nobody else's fault. And he said, and he was amazed. He had come to, to come to the States a few years earlier, saw a kid slide in a second and break his ankle. So they sue the coach, they sue the field, they sue the, you know, the, the, the town. Yeah, kid slides in a second, you might break your ankle. But, you know, he, he said, you Americans are nuts. He said, and, and that is, and that was 25 years ago, almost. And I, it's only gotten worse, right? And we had another one a couple of years ago where a Miami student walked across our intramural field, jumped on our soccer goal, pulled it down on top of them, <laughs> knocked, knocked his teeth out, and he sued, okay. us, sued us for dental because we didn't have it chained up. Right. <laughs> right. Like, that you're supposed to think of every possibility of how a piece of equipment could be misused. That's your, you know. Yeah. yeah. There you go. There you go. And and I guarantee you, Miami uh, U has a has a guy who walks around with a checkbook to pay those guys off. Yep. That, a guy that sues you over the soccer goal, rather than it going to court, because they're going to give him, okay, we'll give you X, you know, because it's going to cost them so much to defend it. So. Yeah, it's it's amazing, and it, uh, it, it it's really I. I, th I think it's what's causing a lot of the fear about COVID and people reopening because even though people have never sued anyone before for people getting sick, I just, because it's been because of, of the, of the way we've reacted to this, 
That's why schools don't want to reopen. That's why sporting events don't reopen because they're all scared to death. Liability. It's not, it's not reality. It's liability. It's, it's, if I look, if I tell my employees, they have to wear masks and my customers, they have, you know what, then neither of them can sue me if they get it. I did what I was supposed to do to prevent. So, uh, so a business person is going to say that's, that's an easy answer for them, whether, you know, no matter what they feel about it, it's, it's safe business-wise. I'm not getting in an argument here about science and all this stuff that you see going back and forth. It's an easy decision. When in Ohio, when they first put that mask ordinance in, you know, he said all the business owners, the governor said all the business owners were like, yeah, do it. And that's why they knew that they were having asking these people to come to work. Well, then if they got the virus, while they were at work, or you don't really know where you get it, but they can't sue you for having got it at work if they've taken the precautions that, you know, wh- whichever science uh, list, science side you're listening to is telling you to be, that's the safe side, well, you're gonna take the safe side because, you know, that's, that's, that's good business practices. Yep. Well, we're 46 minutes in. Holy crap. We haven't even talked about your book yet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have one here. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for showing that up. Uh, tell the audience how, how you got involved with this. This was not a couple of months project. It, it sounds like it took you years and you've got a co-author. Talk, talk us through yeah. how, how well, you got into this. Co- my co-author, Brian Fritz, he, he's, he's, uh, he gets the credit for actually the, the project coming to fruition. We, we talked about doing, something for a long time i met him back when i was um just starting out he was a few years older than me but we we met playing summer softball um you know chit chat you realize hey you know we have similar interests we're both interested in ballparks and baseball like baseball and so we became buddies so we went a couple times to you know ah, let's go let's go see this place we went to buffalo we went to different places to see games and uh, we talked, you know, a thing came up about League Park and fascinated about League Park, both of us. Someday we should write a book. There's never really been a book, you know. So you know, eventually we got to the point where, um, you know, uh, he, he's, he's, he was a prosecutor for the city of Cleveland for almost 40 years. He just retired a couple months ago. And um, he was, uh, I got him involved. I was at John Carroll. Actually, he helped me get the job because he was an alum. Um, so he gave me some background before I went for my interview on some of the folks that were going to be interviewing me. But um, he uh, he would help me when I was the SID at John Carroll. I mean, the, the record keeping was very sketchy. So I said, gee, I, I don't have anything from football from the 20s. Well, the guy would go to the library at lunchtime. You know, he's right downtown Cleveland. And he went through microfilm and got me the football clippings and box score. And you know, we were able to reassemble stats and stuff that was never, had never been done. And so got the, my media guys became really good because they had all this stuff in them. I could send them and I said, Brian, I need you to go look this up. He'd go over at lunch that day and look something up for me. So, um, you know, uh, we were good friends. Again, I stayed friends, even though I had moved and stuff. When I came back, uh, I was at, uh, actually, uh, when I first left, for Maryland. I was, I'd been here working at, at Lake Erie College and uh, I had first left, I came back to visit one of the first times after I was going back and forth to Maryland to work. And he called me up and he said, uh, you know, that project, I got something to show you. So, okay, so we met for lunch downtown and he pulls out this envelope, <laughs> like this thick, all these papers and stuff. And he had typed up like little, you know, some were a paragraph, some were, you know, longer things, different stories, anecdotes. He had spent about a year, maybe more, I don't remember exactly how long, going every lunch, just kind of flipping through, reading the newspapers during the League Park era and coming up with story, you know, stories and tid- tidbits. He goes, so I'm like, wow, flabbergasted. So um, that kind of really started it. And in bursts, I would work on kind of weaving this together adding what needed you know the holes that were there again he was finding some of the things coming up with a structure and and you know again i was a writer he's a lawyer so he 
he's good at finding stuff and researching stuff. I was better at weaving it and writing it and putting it into in, into the, a story, a manuscript. And um, that's what happened. It took us about six six years or so from when he first gave me that until we actually finished it. And um, you know, he's 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 an amazing guy. He's one of those guys. You know, he's got a an amazing memory. Um, when I first, I'll never forget when I first met him playing softball. He was telling me, love John Carroll athletics. And he was telling me about, yeah, when I was a freshman, and so this is probably 10 years removed for him at this time. You know, he was probably late twenties or something. So he's like, when I was a freshman, you know, that was the year we played, uh, you know, Teal on the third weekend. The game was at home at Wasmer Field. I was sitting on the 20 yard line. My parents had come down that weekend but my sister was sick. You know, he remembers everything. And he's telling me plays. He's giving, you know, well, Barrett took the ball at the 30 and he, you know, he spun and he, he's giving me play. And the guy's amazing. You know, he's the savant. So, um, <laughs> so he's the guy that, that drove it to, to get it done. And, and, um, um, you know, he, he, he's an amazing guy and a great friend. And, uh, so I owe a ton to him and, um, it, it was, we're thrilled when we hear somebody like you who says, I read it. We loved it. You know, like that, that, that makes, that makes it, you know, and we do lots of speaking things. We do speaking engagements at libraries and we've done some class things, educational things. Sometimes we're at an Italian American club or, you know, whatever, different groups that are looking for, you know, a topic and a speaker. So we've done uh, dozens and dozens and dozens. And we did a whole last summer was crazy with the all-star game in Cleveland. We were doing all kinds of stuff. Um, so it's been really fun to see that people care about this, this, this old stuff, you know, um, it's, it really is rewarding to, to, to get feedback. So I want to take, if we can take two different approaches to this, because one of the things that stood out to me in the book is this was a multi-use facility. It wasn't just baseball. There were some other th- Baseball was the main thing, but there were some other events that happened there. Um, sure. First, talking about baseball, who were the who were the major tenants that we we know the Indian we know it was right. Cle- well, when, Cleveland when Robeson, baseball. Yep. Mm-hmm. When Robeson built the ballpark in 1891 as a wooden ballpark, that was for the Cleveland Spiders and the National League. Um, they had some really good teams that decade. They won Cleveland's first world championship in the Temple Cup in 1895. They, in 1892 and in 1897, they also went into the playoff uh, thing. They didn't call it the Temple Cup yet in 92. But they were there in not 96. It was. They lost the Temple Cup. So they were really good. Um, he was really mad because um, he wasn't selling enough tickets. He wanted to play games on Sundays. Most ball, most cities that was outlawed. He couldn't win his battle, so he moved his team out of town. <laughs> uh, merged them with the St. Louis team. Essentially, they went out of business after 1899. Is the bottom line. Another whole stories there, all kinds of stuff related to that. But uh, so uh, in 1900, there was a league that had started that um, uh, became the uh, became the American League. Started as the uh, Gee, what the heck was it called? I can't think of it right now. In 1900, it was a, it was a uh, mostly Midwest-based league. They put a team in Cleveland since League Park was vacant uh, from, from the Spiders leaving. Um, they declared themselves a major league, and the American League was formed in 1901. They moved some of the franchises to the East Coast. So that team, the Blues, they were called the Blues because the Spiders' old blue uniforms were still there, so they wore them that year. So the, the Blues, they were the Broncos in 02. And then in 03, they became the Naps because the great Napoleon Lajouet had come to Cleveland in 02. Um, so they named them after him. And um, they stayed that way until the, until uh, 14, when he left, of course, became the Indians. Um, so that franchise then was there for through 46. Who else was tenants was the question. Um, there were a couple of uh, – football teams that that took took uh place there the cleveland bulldogs i believe in 24 
uh, played their home games there, won the uh, the NFL. There was no championship game. It was just won by percentage points. Um, you know, you know, football was very much in flux in those days. So there were teams in and out, sometimes played at Leaf Park, sometimes didn't. Um, and then, of course, the Rams played there. The Cleveland Rams started in 36 through 45 before they moved to Los Angeles, uh, used League Park mostly as their home. There were a couple seasons they didn't, but mostly they used League Park. Um, who else was a tenant? Uh, then, oh, of course, the Cleveland Buckeyes. And there were a couple other Negro League teams that had used it off, off and on, but the Buckeyes were, over the final years of League Park, uh, used it. There were tenants there. Um, those are the main tenants uh, of the of the building. Uh, Western Reserve University and some of the uh, colleges uh, also used it. John Carroll used it as a home field for a couple of seasons. Western Reserve used it for quite a few seasons. And there were a lot of times that games were played there by the other teams, Ball Wallace and Case Tech. They were called the Big Four back in the 30s and garnered a ton of attention in Cleveland, those four schools. And when they play each other, oftentimes uh, they would play at League Park. So um, lots of games were played there. Lots of uh, uh, other things happened. There were some uh, big boxing matches that occurred there. Um, Johnny Kilbane was a great uh, 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 champion boxer who was from Cleveland. He boxed there a couple times. Um, one of the oddities, I believe it was 1916, 15 or 16, there was an opera held at there. And it was actually on June 21st, which makes sense because – there were no lights, of course, but that's the longest day of the year, the latest day of sunset. So they were able to hold the opera that started at, you know, whatever, 6.30 or 7 o'clock or something. And, you know, they have, you have light until 9. So um, there was an opera that was held there. They built a stage and whatnot. That's probably the oddest event that ever happened there. But, uh, yeah, it was certainly used for other things. You know, again, before the stadium was built, you know, down on the lakefront, that was – the most seats at anywhere in Cleveland and, you know, by far the most seats, you know, public hall didn't, wasn't even built until I guess it was 24, 25, you know, as an indoor venue, um, you know, that seated about, well, depending on the event, anywhere from, from eight to 12 or 14,000, something like that, if it was a stage event. So. In your research, I, I, I can't, I can't recollect it off the top of my head. What, what event had the biggest crowd and what, what was the, the attendance? Uh, yeah, definitely baseball. Uh, the record crowd, like, records were not very well kept. A lot of times it would say that, you know, this is the largest crowd. And it was, you know, in the early days, they'd say this crowd of 12,000 was the largest crowd. When the year before they reported that there were 13,000 at a game, you know, <laughs> no one really, you know, a lot of it was off the cuff. But really, uh, the largest uh, purported crowds were, uh, mid thirties, um, you know, in, in, in the 1934, 35 era when, and the crowds were about the same in the mid thirties, I think 34 to 35,000. And the irony of that is that that's now what the, the scaled back, um, progressive field originally Jacobs field, now progressive field, you know, is scaled back to almost the size, almost the same size as League Park at its largest capacity, um, we're, we're talking about the same numbers. And of course, for many years, the Indians played at, you know, uh, nearly 80,000 seat stadium, which p some people, you know, to this day, you know, speak negatively of. I absolutely loved Cleveland Stadium, whether there were 2,000 people there or 80,000. It was a phenomenal venue. And a very, very significant venue. And one of the storylines in the League Park book is when it was constructed, you know, the, it was the first publicly funded ballpark. There had been, you know, Los Angeles Coliseum had been built, obviously publicly funded, but, you know, a ballpark had not, you know, they were private, you know, private places like an amusement park. You build your amusement park and you get people to come there and you want them to buy, you know, souvenirs and food and whatever while they're there. Well, that's the ballparks were the same thing. And the idea of a public uh, entity, a city building a ballpark had never come around before. And so that struggle between the existence of League Park and, and the coexistence with Municipal Stadium is a phenomenal uh, sidelight story that, that runs through the book. Um, so the, uh, the League Park not only is a uh, was a, a famous place and a famous baseball venue and lots of amazing 
things happen there that were truly incredible. Like, you know, uh, you know, from everybody knows about most everybody knows about Babe Ruth's 500th home run being there. You know, Joe DiMaggio got his 56th game of the 56 game hitting streak there. And, you know, some some really key ones like that that happened. Um, but more importantly, the history of League Park weaves throughout the history of baseball. You know, the whole thing of changing the changeover from wooden ballparks to steel and concrete. Um, the birth of the American League weaves right through the uh, the Federal League, the third major league that came in in 14 and 15. League Park has a role in that. You know, the owner of the, uh, of the Indians at the time moved his minor league team to League Park so that there was, a, you know, to keep the feds out, to keep the Federal League from putting a team in Cleveland. So it ties into that. It ties, it ties into, um, you know, uh, urban geography. Um, you know, again, it, taxes and, and, and the funding of the municipal stadium and, and that struggle and the criticism that the city took for building that ballpark and just assuming the Indians were going to move there. Um, they owned League Park. <laughs> they really didn't have a reason to move there. They, they tried it a little bit, and then they went back, and then they wound up sharing, you know, two stadiums for over a decade, the only time in baseball history something like that happened. So, uh, again, uh, you read those names and those things and, and those occurrences that, you know, even the, the 1919 – Black Sox scandal ties so closely to League Park because that 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 story broke in 20. That's when the Indians won their pennant, you know. So all of this was going on while the Indians were having their greatest year, and the White Sox were right there with them, you know, in the pennant race. Um, so it, it really is a fascinating um, history. Uh, it, it, our our working title for the book was "In a League of Its Own" because we felt that the, the book. Or the, the ballpark had so many occurrences. It was just uncanny how many of the great things in baseball history tied through and happened there. And the uh, uh, the publisher, which were you know again first time I ever had a book and found a publisher, he was like, no no no, no one's going to know what that means. We have to call it League Park. So we did. <laughs> but um, it doesn't that doesn't change the pretense of what our working title was. I think it's accurate that the place is in a league of its own. The fact that it's survived is puts it in a league almost of its own as well. There's a couple of examples kind of like that. Um, but, but, you know, this, the fact that that, that place stayed for all those years kind of not being used is, is amazing. Um, it, it just, there's so many things about the place that, that fascinate me. And, and I think make the, make the book, a, a an interesting read. We talked at the beginning about how it was shoehorned into a neighborhood on an empty empty block. Talk about the unique dimensions of the ball field because yeah. that, that that's amazing to me. Just and it, and then it, the great thing is, is now in the rebuilt field, they have matched the layout of that ballpark from its heyday. You know, the plates in the same place. The you know, it's exactly the same. It's two ninety down the line uh, to right field. Uh, with with a 45 foot fence, which is it was actually 20 feet of wall and 25 feet of fencing above it uh, when it was built in 1910. But you know you get that feel. The the new one doesn't go as far down towards center field, but again you get a feel for what that was like with that high wall and right. You know 460 to the base of the wall and, and you know below the scoreboard and dead center field. So you know no ball was ever hit out to dead center field because it would have had to be 590 feet or whatever to clear the scoreboard and everything and get out there at that deepest part of the ballpark. But it made for great baseball because, you know, 385 down the left field line. So you had this huge left field, but this short porch in right with a high wall, you know, these packed in stands, the upper deck overhanging the lower, you're looking right down on the field balls are zinging off the wall there's that like i say there's concrete there's fence there's steel girders of uh, you know there that face in so the, you know a fly ball to right the second baseman runs out there the right fielder turns around and looks at the wall the center fielder sprints over because it could hit that the <coughs> could hit that fencing and drop straight down it might hit the the hard concrete wall and rebound hard back it might hit 
you know, the girders or whatever, who knows which way it might, you know, rebound, tear them off the wall. So it was exciting. It's, you know, balls in the gap in left center, uh, and you know, so deep. Um, and then you, you know, and then throw in Tris Speaker, the greatest defensive center fielder in the history of the game, you know, playing shallow with a 460 behind him, played <laughs> shallow. And, and four times in his career, played so shallow against guys that sure base hits look like they were going in runner on second assumes it's a hit here comes speedy great center fielder speaker takes this you know makes a great catch off the top blades of the grass and with his momentum going towards second base just runs in and beats the runner back who hadn't tagged up thinking it was a base hit and turns an unassisted double play from center field he did it four times in his career <laughs> you know like <laughs> You can't write, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> so it was a great place to watch baseball. Uh, the dimensions had a lot to do with that, I think. Um, it, it, it's, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating place. And, and it's still there. Yeah. There's still a field there. And that, 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 that building on the corner that was the ticket office and the, and the team offices on the second floor, that's still there. And there's a museum in there now that a guy named Mr. Bob Zimmer uh, put, has his memorabilia and, and assorted other stuff that he calls it the Baseball Heritage Museum. It's pretty cool. It's worth a trip. That, that was going to be my next question was, when did your book release correspond with the city deciding to renovate the field? And if you could talk a little bit more with the audience about what what the city did with, with the ball field. Yeah, that, that we, we locked out. You know, the thing was, we got so into this book and we started finding – you said, you know, way back at the beginning, you talked about your grandma saying she went there and saw Babe Ruth and stuff. And we tried really hard to find people to tell us stories. We wanted to have the last section be people's remembrances. Brian was trying to track down people, and but everyone was the same. I remember riding the streetcar to the game with my mom or my dad or my grandma or whatever. It was the same remembrance. So we didn't put that into the book because we really weren't picking up unique stories. Um, certainly not enough of them and to, to warrant what we were trying to do. So um, that came out. Um, I lost my train of thought a little bit on the question here. Uh, um, the, the book release corresponding with- Oh, the right, right, okay, sorry. So um, we, could, we kept finding more stuff. Again, this is, you know, we're in six years, seven years in, whatever, and you know, we're finding out more stuff. And finally, we're like, you know, we have, all right, enough. We're, you know, we, we can't, we, we have to, we were getting tidbits on little stories and little things, but finally we, we, we needed to get it done. Well, we turn it to the publisher, it's 13. And, you know, late, right about when we turned it to the publisher, I guess it was late 12, um, the city announced they were going to fund some renovation of the field. So we're like, oh, wow, you know, we lucked out. And the book came out in uh, late 13 and then four, you know, the renovation had already begun. 14 was when they dedicated the new field uh, on that spot. So um, yeah, we lucked out um, on that. That was just, <laughs> that was just by happenstance that, that, that we hit on that one kind of, we, we kind of got sick of, of going back and putting in some little other little addition. We said at some point we got to get this thing printed. And luckily we found a printer uh, McFarland out of North Carolina, you know, took, took it on and, and, uh, it, it continues like that. That's one of the amazing things, you know, and maybe it happens with all history books. I don't know. They can, you know, have a, a longer life and something that's very topical or timely, but because there's been this, these different spurts of interest, you know, the history of the Negro leagues and, and, you know, the all-star game coming to Cleveland and, and, uh, you know, uh, um, the museum itself opening there, those, those, all of those things have helped perpetuate this. And so we keep, you know, we keep getting interest and it's really fun. That's neat. Uh, talk about, talk about the, the fields that are there and who, who's using those now? Well, no one used them this summer. The city of Cleveland shut down their, their the, the field. Um, and, and other parks and stuff with the virus and all that going on. So uh, no one did this summer. Um, uh, 
but uh, the, the museum, um, they operate, uh, they have a guy that uh, used to coach at George Washington University and then at Cleveland State, who I'm friendly with, uh, by the name of Jay Murphy. He, he runs a, a program that's backed by the museum. So their intent now, this is new, newer, uh, is to play there um, and to use that field. But high school, city high schools can use it. Uh, city of Cleveland High Schools because it's a city park, so that they they use it in the springtime. Again, that didn't happen this year, but they do. Uh, other high schools come in and they do have to pay a fee. They rent the field from the city if they're you know uh, if they're you know from suburbs or elsewhere. Um, I was fortunate enough with Jay, the guy I just mentioned. He was coaching um, uh, a different in a different program, but he had a, a collegiate summer team, um, and I was uh, helping him with that with that team. My son was playing for them at the time he was at Stone College. And so uh, those three years, uh, we used uh, League Park at, for home games, uh, especially on the weekends, we used to, we played home games there. So there's a, a you know, a smattering of things, you know, uh, folks can rent the field if you, you know, if you have an over 30 team or whatever, you can, you have to go through the city of Cleveland, the museum is separate, it does not operate the field. Um, so that's, that's a separate entity, but, um, uh, yeah, the field's there and it's used by, you know, um, quite a few different, um, groups. Uh, they try to run camps and clinics there and stuff at times The major league baseball, uh, had, had dibs on it that whole week last year, leading up to the all-star game. They ran a youth league tournament with teams from all over the country. Um, they used a couple other fields, but, you know, league park got a lot of attention there too. So. You ever see ghosts of old ball players when you've been there? <laughs> I will tell you this. I can imagine it. I, you know, I, it, when I did this research and, you know, um, looked at so many pictures, you know, and again, trying to piece together the history and, you know, some of the narrative we had to do via photos, you know, by saying, Oh, look, here's look, they added some seats here and whatever by dating the photos and whatnot. And I looked at those photos so closely and so many times, you know, I, I go there and I, I can see it, you know, it's, it's ingrained in my mind. Um, I haven't seen anyone come out of a cornfield, not that there's <laughs> any there, but uh, I, I certainly can, I can feel, you know, when you're there, there is this, a magical feeling of saying like, you know, when you're on that mound and you say, Holy cow, you know, like Cy Young stood here, you know, <laughs> like he pitched here. Bob Feller pitched here. And I'm standing here now, you know. Um, you know, not, you go to center field and you know, see where see see speaker's view of, you know, from center field and uh, you know, that I'm just scratching the surface because really pretty much every key ball player from eighteen ninety one through the mid forties you know, set foot in there at some point. And, you know, that, that's pretty special. Yeah. You know, it didn't get plowed under. I mean, by the fact that there was, that the neighborhood, you know, declined and stuff, there was an interest in plowing it under and building something else there. So then the city took it over and it became a park. And, you know, it, 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 it stayed in some form for all these years. Uh, the fact that it did that is miraculous. And then, you know, that what's left is the opportunity to go there. Yeah. You can go see where the polo grounds was and there's high rises there. You can go see where Forbes field was and, you know, Pitt's campus is built over the top of most of where it was. There's a piece of the wall and the outfield that's still up, but you know, here you can, like I say, you can stand on that mound or at that plate or in center field or wherever you want and think about, you know, what it was and, it's it's pretty cool i've got three tough questions for you okay when you were writing the book who who did you think of being as your favorite athlete that you learned about when you wrote it i i was fascinated by some of the things that that um, that Brian came up with um, some of the smaller stories, maybe even more, you know, because you knew about Ruth. We knew, you know, well before we were writing the book, we knew about the Maggio '56 and and that stuff. We we found a couple of those that weren't really well, well known. Walter Johnson's 3,000 strikeout was there, 
But like, you know, Brian found this clip from opening day, I forget what year, you know, pretty early on in the teens or 20s. And, you know, this it was a story in the Cleveland press or news. It wasn't in the plane. It was a press or in the news. And a uh, guy, some brother, older brothers snuck, got in. They brought their tiny brother with them. The kid was like four or five or something. He got in. He went under the turnstile and got in for free. They lost him photographer from the paper has took this picture and here's the kid sitting in the the cylinder down the line during the game with the tarp wrapped up around it and that's where the kid somehow got to <laughs> I think that, that would happen nowadays you know those brothers or parents would be in jail or something but you know stories like that there's just some tidbits in there that were just so funny and amazing and and I guess I, I guess I, I I liked that part of it. Um, there was a story I had heard about three errors on on one play uh, that happened at League Park. That's we debunked that in the book. But but to actually find that and what they were talking about, there was a ball that went to right field. It was the story was he, the same player made three errors on one play that he booted the ball. It went past him, rebounded off that wall. He booted it again, then he turned, picked it up, turned and threw it as the guy was going into third and threw it wildly and, and the runner came home. So he got supposedly three errors on the same play. Well, that, that, that's not a true story. I think it was, was, was it Smeed Jolly, I think was the guy's yeah, name. I've, I've heard that story. It was Smeed Jolly. Well, again, we went through box scores trying to find a game where he had, where there was no game where he had three errors, let alone one play. So this story has perpetrated itself. I first heard it when I was in high school. I, I umpired Little League, and I went, to the um, I went to this umpiring class, and the guy told this story the, the, of the three errors at League Park on the same play. So this story has been going around for decades, and it shows up sometimes that it happened at Comiskey Park and other places. But mostly it's the stories that it was in Cleveland. Well, Smee Jolly never made three errors, and we, you know, we, we know that for a fact. There was clearly a play where we, we even, in the book, we even figure out kind of where that happened. He misplays a ball, and again, this tall tale came out. We were very fortunate to have dispelled some of the, um, not only that story, but some other in, in, inaccuracies about League Park and its history. Um, some tiny, small like that some big you know people that, there are all these anthology books about ballparks they're very common people like ballparks so there have been a lot of books and you know a couple pages on our page or two pictures on different places and without fail everyone would say like well you know and league park was called dunfield uh when jim uh sonny jim dunn bought the indians in 1916 he changed the name to league to dunfield and it was dunfield until 1927 well, that's not true, uh, and we we documented it. It was he. It was still League Park. He did declare when he bought the team that he was going to win a championship for the city of Cleveland. He did in 1920, and then, and it's in the paper. He said, "Now you can call it Dunfield. I fulfilled my 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 want my wish to bring a, a championship here. So we're going to call it Dunfield." So on opening day 1921, he had a flag flying that said Dunfield and all this stuff. And so you know, again, so even box scores, if you went in. They used to say, if it was 1916, it was played in Cleveland, it said Dunn Field, 17, 18, 19, 20. And that's not true. It was League Park. So we've gotten that corrected. That's been corrected in, like, in RetroSheet and those things that post those old box scores. Um, it took a lot of time because people don't believe us at first. We even got some stuff at the library that was wrong that we were able to correct, some pictures that were misidentified and different things that we came across over the years. So th there were so many of those um, successes that, you know, you know, Brian's, hey, he's a lawyer, you know, he's into detail and whatever. And, you know, I, being a sports info guy, you know, sports folk relations guy in the beginning of my career, you know, that stuff matters, history and getting the stats right and the records right. So we took a lot of pride in that. So it was probably more those kind of things that fascinated us or whatever than for me to be able to say to you, it was this player that became my favorite player because my favorite things are those kinds of stories. And some of the things that I, you know, there were some guys that surfaced maybe that I didn't know about, even if they weren't 
really significant guys through the history, but kind of did something cool or I didn't know. But I liked reading about, like I said, the Ruth stuff I liked because my dad told me my dad's favorite player when he was growing up in the 30s was Earl Averill. So I really liked that. And I really liked that we found a picture of Earl Averill, you know, sitting uh, against the wall. He was there in the winter to sign his contract. And here he is in, the, you know, some snow on the ground and stuff. And, you know, and I'm like, geez, that was my dad's favorite player when, he, when my dad was, a, you know, a kid, you know. So th those kind of things are probably what meant the most to me. You, you may have answered my other two questions that were tied with that. I was going to ask you what favorite <laughs> – I was going to ask you, what was your favorite story that you discovered or what was your favorite discovery of any sort when you were writing the book? Yeah. Yeah. There's just so many of those. Again, that's, that's what makes the book is that we, we you know, and, and things that I think, you know, Brian gets a lot of credit for having the wherewithal to, you know, spend so many lunch over hours over there and, 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 you know, skim through microfilm of newspapers and coming up with, with some of these oddities, odd notes and whatever. So yeah, there's just so many of them that I, I don't know if I would have a favorite. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know if I could narrow down a favorite, but there are certain, you know, certain themes that I love. I love that we kind of figured out the story of the that fight between the Municipal Stadium and League Park that really had never been chronicled anywhere. Yeah, people, it was kind of, oh yeah, they shared two parks, you know. They were, yeah, but to find out how that happened and why and kind of learn the history of that, um, that was fascinating. And, and you know, the egg on the face of the city of Cleveland. Here's this, here's this other stadium down the, you know, Matt, again, let's draw a parallel. What if in Boston, the city of Boston had built a massive stadium in the 1930s and, you know, the Red Sox owned Fenway. You know, uh, well, wait a minute, what are they going to do? You know, so, uh, you know, it really is a, you know, that, that, that kind of stuff to me is uh, um, the most fascinating and that it ties in again, like I said, urban geography and, and, and finances and, and so many different things that the, that the story touches on. Um, it, it's, it's pretty cool to think that all these things keep pointing back to this, baseball field so cool tell the audience about your twitter feed i i love your twitter <laughs> um yeah I, I do too i uh brian will t text me some days so although you know like in the morning i'll get a text from him. uh 20 1929 so and so had you know walked five times or something like that <laughs> they you know so i'll go to i'll go to you know i'll look the game up and, you know, try and put the whatever fact he's got and put it into context. Like he did that the other day. He sent me something. And uh, turned out the game we was talking about was actually also Feller's 20th win of the year that year. And so, you know, I was able to really kind of put a neat anecdote with some, some oddball things all together. So I'll really read that box score when he comes up with one of those, you know. Um, and I come across stuff, too. I always read those day in the – you know, this day in sports history stuff and whatnot. There was one that was happened to be in our local, the suburban taper here the other day. Um, and the news Herald, um, it, it was, it said it was a little, little, you know, today in 1920, whatever it was, uh, so-and-so hit four doubles, you know, for the Indians. And I looked the game up. Yeah. It was a league park game and it was actually a double header. We lost two games to Boston who was in last place. So it became a better story than just saying he had four doubles it was four, he was five for eight, four doubles in, in, in the game that, you know, we lost twice to the worst team in the league. We were in second fighting for first, you know, it became a, you know, but again, to try and get that in 140 characters is a <laughs> challenge. So, you know, thank goodness I was a journalism major because I'm, I've gotten pretty good at, at, at trying to weave those things in, in there and catch the attention. And it amazes me sometimes I'll put one of those down that I think is really cool and it gets, you know, it'll get likes or whatever. And then sometimes you'll put one in it. It, it just will go like viral, you know, like it gets retweets by people that have tons of followers. And all of a sudden there's hundreds and hundreds of likes and all these views. And, you know, so it's fun to try and come up with them. And uh, yeah, I, I really kind of take pride in trying to uh, relate it somehow. 
You know, if something happens in an Indians game, you know, somebody has a, if you get, if you skim through all the league, you know, our, our Twitter site, you'd come across ones where you, something happened that night in an Indians game. Well, that was the first time that happened or the most since such and such a day at league card. So if we can tie it back to the history and that, that really, I think, um, uh, catches a lot of people's attention because it, 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 it does draw you back. And then again, it, 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 it feeds to our, our theme of how much stuff happened there that was just, you know, out of the ordinary. And it, it's, it's just, it, it is, it's inordinate how many of these oddball fact things happened to happen there. You know, the, I mean, Ray, Ray Chapman, you know, and coming up on his hundredth anniversary of death, that didn't happen at League Park. He was playing for the 1920 Indians. Of course, it happened in the Polo Grounds in New York, but the impact at League Park, the fact that that happened, that that, that that again, it's what are the odds that all of these most unbelievable things in the history of baseball somehow point their way back to League Park? It is really, uh, if you were trying to take odds on it, it would be for some pretty long odds. And how how can the audience find the book? And is there a way that people can get a hold of you if they'd like to reach out and learn more about League Park? Right. I would say the best thing to do, well, to get the book, you can either go to the McFarland website in North Carolina, or you can just Google League Park book. It'll come up. You can get it through Amazon or, or uh, Barnes and Noble or whatever. Some of the bookstores around have copies. And again, we're, you know, it's 14, so it's six years later. Yeah. It's, you know, you don't find it regularly, but any bookstore will order you any book as well. So if you like going to the bookstore, you can certainly get it through them. Any of them will order it for you. But you can order it yourself, again, through either those sites. If you Google it, sometimes there'll be sales at certain places. So you can, you know, the, the uh, publisher price is twenty nine ninety five, I guess. So you can get it for sometimes less. McFarland a couple times a year does like, you know, 40% off all baseball books or different series is that they have. So sometimes it'll show up on them. If you, if you're a patient, you can save some money sometimes. Um, but yeah, if they, if they want to track us down, I mean, through the Twitter site is probably the best way at league park, CLE, CLE, league park, CLE, um, uh, is the best way you can, you know, say you want to get us, well, I'll, I'll friend you or whatever we have to do so we can communicate, um, you know, again, if you have a, somebody has a, a group that's looking for speakers to come out, we have a really cool um, PowerPoint, uh, that, you know, and again, that's grown because we've, there's things that we, pictures and things we found since the book was published that aren't in the book that we use for now for the, with the PowerPoint. Um, so we do those. So yeah, that's out there um, as well. So if people want to, um, do that. We did the presentation at the uh, at the Tribe Fest a couple of years ago, and we've uh, they've been uh, you know had us down there uh, have a presence the last couple after we did that. So that's cool. We get to meet some of the people, and you know it's always rewarding. Like I say, when somebody comes up and says, "Yeah, I read it and really liked it and stuff." So that, that's you know makes that whole thing of having spent all that time worthwhile. Uh, especially because a little side story. I've told this before. You know, when, when we were getting close to getting done with it, and I called a friend in Philadelphia who had had a couple of books published, and I said uh, to him, you know, how'd you find a publisher? What's the process? Do you have any suggestions? He had me tell him about the book. He said, that sounds like a cool book. He said, but no, no publisher's going to take it. Nobody's going to buy it. <laughs> and my heart sunk, you know, we'd spent all this time. And he said, you know, he said, the place has been closed since 1946 and the Indians, he says, you don't have many people that have been, this is, you know, again, we're talking 19 or 2012, you know, he says, there's hardly anybody around that's been there that remembers it, whatever. He goes, they don't publish books because for that era of people, they don't buy books about, you know, that 80 year olds don't buy books or whatever. <laughs> well, luckily we found a publisher. Um, that, that did take it. And in history, you can go further back than the actual people in it. And Cleveland history is pretty cool. I think there's a special thing there. And like you said, your, your grandma or whoever, you know, and, and we do hear that story. And, and there, the, when we do those talks, when we're at a library or a, a presentation, it's unbelievable how we'll finish. And 
you know, we'll talk for an hour, hour and 15 minutes generally as, as a presentation. And we're there another hour usually because people will come up after and they want to tell the story of their grandma or whatever. And, you know, it, it's, it's cool. It, it really, again, that's been tremendously rewarding to, to have seen, to see that. And that, uh, you know, there are people that, that do care about history and this stuff. And um, uh, I, I, I'm very pleased with that. I will point out that I get frustrated of um, the lack of respect for history among um, modern, younger people. Um, that's been a, you know, there have been some Twitter things that we've, you know, we've seen, and you know, where people say, well, Babe Ruth today would stink. He was fat and out of shape. And oh my God, those kind of things, you know, I, I, I try to say, you know, try to put some perspective, you know, greatness knows no time. Um, geniuses in, in, you know, in 1800 would be geniuses today. They just, they don't, wouldn't benefit from all the things that we've learned since 1800 till today. They, you know, they'd have to catch up on that stuff, but they'd still be genius. Great athletes would be great athletes. People that try to dismiss um, that uh, um, anything before 1947 doesn't count because baseball wasn't integrated. Well, I can give you arguments that say, but there were no, hardly anybody was playing basketball or anything else. You know, there, it was, you know, almost everyone played baseball. I, I, so these kinds of things come up at times and I get frustrated from that part of, of uh, defending um, some of the things that these folks did. Yeah, and I agree, you know, uh, if you just threw a guy from, you know, 1900 into 2020 baseball, yeah, it's, it's different. But if you took that same person and had him born where he would be alive in 2020, I'm pretty sure Again, he's taking advantage of all we've learned since then, all of the nutrition, all of the, you know, the strength training, all of the things that today's athletes benefit from, from. Well, that guy, if he was born in today, he would still be a great player. He was a great player then because he, because of great, like I said, that genius was the same way. The guy that thought of stuff, wrote things, figured stuff out way back, they'd be geniuses today. They'd just be doing you know, way more advanced stuff. This is way more advanced stuff in, in sports today because we've learned a lot and we've we've progressed. Yep. I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, well, I'll, I, I will put all these things in the show notes. I, I've got detailed show notes for the audience. So they'll, they'll have references to your Twitter on how to get the book and the things we talked about today. Yeah, because I don't know if anyone's going to make it. We've been going over an hour. <laughs> I, I'm, I believe I'm going to break this up into a couple different episodes. <laughs> maybe maybe even three. But, there you uh, go. But, yeah. Uh, if you can hold the line, Ken, just for a moment. Yes. Sir. Thank you for tuning in to the Outstanding Ohioan Show. This was episode 87 with Ken Kresovodlik, who is – Solid. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's been a while since I said it. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, he was the author of the great book, League Park, Historic Home of Cleveland Baseball, 1891 to 1946. Thank you for listening and have a great day.